Have a seat. Last week, Doc started a sermon series called Listen, and he talked about all the ways that we don't hear, all the reasons, all the excuses why we don't hear. And he talked about noise-canceling headphones, and he talked about earwax issues. You guys remember that? There were pictures. I heard you guys groan, right? It was awful. But at the end of it all, at the end of it all, it wasn't so much all the excuses as to why we don't hear. I think at the end of it all, the lesson, the, the takeaway was that really the, the issue we have is we don't want to listen. But there's something within each of us that we just don't really even want to listen. There's something that causes us to just, I, I don't know, a fixation on ourselves, I'm not sure what it is, but we just don't want to listen, right? We don't want to hear what other people are saying. It's interesting to me because there's, there, there's this thing that I do with couples who are getting ready to be married. Before their marriage, we do some counseling things. We try to walk through ways in which they can make their marriage a better relationship, okay? And we talk, I, I spend a lot of time talking about communication, okay? I think that that's the biggest thing that, that resolves problems, it, it prevents problems. Good communication is necessary for a good, healthy marriage. And I have this, like, outline of these different principles of good communication to share with this, you know, young couple before they're getting married. And the very first principle for good communication is be a ready listener. And it's counterintuitive. When we think about how we can be better communicators, we think about how we can say words better, how we can make sure that we're being more clear, we're being more careful with all the things that we're saying. And the problem is that the majority of the time when there's an issue in our communication, it's, up, it's, it's usually because of this. It's because we're not listening, that we're not a ready listener. We're not actually listening to what's being said to us. The Bible backs up these ideas. In Proverbs 18, it says, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. I love that word folly because we don't get to use it enough, all right? It's a fun one. It just means foolish. I mean, what he's really saying is, is that he who answers before listening, the person who talks before hearing what the other person has said, 
is stupid. It's dumb. It doesn't make sense. You're a fool if you communicate like that. James 1.19, he says it this way. He says, my dear brothers, take note of this. All right, anytime you read something like that in the Bible, that should kind of bring your attention in like, ooh, he's about to say something. That's really important, okay? And so then he says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, which is fascinating to me because we're the opposite. We're really quick to be angry. We're really quick to speak, and we're very slow to listen. It just seems to be our natural inclination. And I love the fact that James writes this to other Jesus followers, he communicates to them, but he has something so big and important, he doesn't want them to miss it, so he has to pause and say, take note of this. Like this is, the, like, this is like if you're in class and the teacher says, hey, you're going to want to write this down. It's going to be on the test. Pay attention to this. Take note of this. It's, it's what he's doing to grab their attention, to make them listen. And then the message is, you should be better at listening. <laughs> I think it's fascinating, right? We struggle with this. The reality is I don't want to really listen to anybody, ever. Like, if I'm going to listen to you, it needs to fit my agenda. It needs to fit my time. It has to be convenient for me. We become professionals. Doc talked about this last last week. We become professionals at blocking out noise. Even, like, the listening, like, there's this whole realm of, of how we block out things that we don't want to hear. We intentionally keep from either seeing them or hearing them. There's a, like this bank app thing that's on your phones probably where you can check your bank accounts and you know if there's less money in there than you wish there was, you just don't open it. <laughs> like I'm just not going to look at it. It's depressing. If I don't look at it, I can pretend I have more money than I really do. People don't go to doctors because they don't want to hear bad news. It doesn't make sense, right? You know there's people who don't go to church because they don't want to hear what God might have to say? We don't want to listen. I mean, what if you don't want to listen to God? What if that's your problem? What if you just don't even want to hear what God has to say? You see, I don't think that we're actually bad at hearing. I think the issue is that we don't want to listen. And if we're going to define listening, it has that hear component. Hearing is necessary for listening when we're talking about this, but it's more than that. Listening is whenever you hear something, but then when you respond appropriately. That's listening, right? Right? If you're a parent and you have kids and you tell them something, you give them some sort of instructions, and then they don't do it, all right, because they're kids, okay? So they don't do it. They don't pay attention. They don't do what you said. And then later you're talking to your friend about how awful your children are. If you're a kid in the room, you just need to know this happens, okay? And so we're talking about how awful you are, and what we say is, my kid doesn't listen, right? The word isn't they don't obey. The word isn't that they, that they can't hear, we know they hear. The, the voice created these sound waves, and it went through time, and it hit their ear, and, they, and it, like, reg- registered. It, they, they got it. They just didn't pay attention to it. They didn't listen. They didn't respond appropriately. Men, you've heard this, right? <laughs> Your wife has said something to you, and then, then a response was expected, and it could have been a verbal response back, like in a, like a real-life communication and conversation, all right? Like so, so maybe that was the appropriate response. Maybe, maybe her words were instructions, and she accepted, expected you to do something with those instructions, and then you didn't do it, and then your wife says to you, you aren't listening to me, right? It's not a matter of hearing. It's a matter of listening. And it's the same with God. When we go through this series, and we want to talk about how to do life with God, and what it's like to hear from God. The reality is that he's, it's, it's not that he's quiet necessarily. It's not that he refuses to talk. The issue is that we just aren't listening. And it goes back to that James chapter 1 passage that we read earlier. James is the brother of Jesus. He's writing to other fellow believers. These are people who've accepted Jesus and they've bought into who he is. They believe in him, right? And then he says this, don't fool yourselves into thinking that you are the listener, that you're a listener, when you are anything but Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. This is, this is like scripture. This is God's word. This is God's communication to us. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're actually a listener of God when his words just kind of hit one ear and they go straight out the other. What does a non-listener look like? It's someone who hears but doesn't pay attention. It's someone who hears but doesn't respond appropriately. It looks like someone who ignores the words that God has given you. And so he says, act on what you hear. Listening 
means appropriate response. When you hear it, you act appropriately. And then he goes on. He says, those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror. They walk away. Two minutes later, they have no idea who they are, what they look like. It's like Dory from <laughs> Finding Nemo, right? So that, that's, what, that's what it looks like. Those who don't hear, that, this, is what it, this is what it looks like. It's, it's foolishness. It's that word folly again. Those who don't listen to God are fools, especially when it's people who have claimed to have a relationship with God. And then he finishes with this. James says this. He says, any time or anyone who sets himself up as religious and they talk a good game, they're just self-deceived. He said, this kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. That we talk this up, we act as if we care deeply about our God and yet we don't let his words infiltrate our life. We don't respond with an appropriate response. We don't have any sort of action to back up what he's communicated. And it's self-deceiving. It's, it's how we pat ourselves on the back without actually accomplishing anything. It's a bunch of hot air. So what if you don't want to listen to God? If within you, if you look within and you see that you don't really want to listen to God, you have no desire to listen to God, and we're doing a sermon series on how to listen and hear God and to live with God, and so how can you avoid it? The most, the most promising way, the best way that you can feel confident that God isn't going to speak to you is if you make sure you don't ever spend any time in his word, that you don't ever look in scripture, that you don't ever read the Bible. And likewise, I mean, the opposite of that would be that if you do want to hear God's voice, if there's anything within you that's curious about what the God of the universe, who's created all these things that we see and that we live within, that this God who's made it all, if, if there's any chance that he's wanted to talk to us, that he's wanted to communicate to us, if there's any curiosity within you that wants to know who God is or what he's about, then you should be connected to God's word. Why is it that we look at everywhere else. You ever thought about that? We want God to just speak to us directly, as terrifying as that would be. We fool ourselves thinking that would just be easier. I want God to speak to me, you know, straight up, or, or God, I want you to come to me in a dream. God, I want you to reveal yourself in some other way. We want every other way possible, and we ignore the Word of God where He's communicated very clearly to us. It's right there in front of us. It's so easily available to us, and we blow it off like it's second rate. The reality is the foundation. In fact, all the other ways that God could or will speak to us are measured against his word. It comes back to scripture. In fact, as we go through this series, we're going to talk about lots of different ways that God speaks to us. And every single week, we're going to keep coming back to scripture. We're going to keep coming back to it because that's the measuring stick. That's how we can really see, uh, be able to test and see whether or not he's really actually speaking to us because the surest way that we have the surest way we have of knowing what God wants, and that is of us, what he wants of us, what he wants for us, what he wants from us, the surest way we have of knowing what God wants is in examining the words he's made available to us. If you want to listen to God, the surest way you can do it is to step into his word. Now, there's a chance, probably a really good chance, there's some of you in this room right now who question whether or not the Bible really is actually God's word. Okay? <laughs> And that's a big question, and I would love to talk about it. I don't have time, but it's too important to just blow off, all right? And so if that's where you're at, if, if you're struggling with that question, in fact, if, you know, for those of you in the room, this isn't necessarily to you, but if you're watching this online, if you're watching this sometime after the moment that I'm actually saying these things, and you're curious as to whether or not you can actually believe that the Bible is actually God's Word, I want you to hit pause, and I want you to go to our YouTube channel. I want you to scroll down in our videos, not very far. Go to October 30th, 2022, less than a year ago. Doc preached a sermon specifically on that subject of why it is that we can look at the Bible and we can believe that it is God's word. We'll talk more about it even on Wednesday night, if that's a big question for you again. However, I don't have time to get into that today. We're going to move forward from the rest of this time with the assumption that the Bible is God's word that he's given to us. And I want you to recognize that it isn't second rate. It's not substandard. 
The idea that God would give us something in written form isn't a lesser version of communication. In fact, intuitively, we know that when you get something in, in word, if we get it in, in written form, if, if we have something wrote down, it means more, doesn't it? There's power behind that. There's a significant power in the written word. It's why we care deeply about legal documents and signing our names to things, right? It's a different level of accountability. You've maybe seen this within your own family. Maybe you've seen this in the families uh, of your friends whenever there's like a last will and testament. You've probably seen the good and the bad side of this. You've seen the person who verbally communicated what they wanted done after their passing and how to handle their estate, but they never had it written down. And then after their death, you see a family split apart arguing over how to work through the estate, right? Having it in writing didn't make it lesser. It actually made it more valid. It makes it more strong. It makes it more significant. It brings clarity. That's what written word does. And when we receive something in writing, it means something special to us. Years ago for Mother's Day, I bought my mom a, uh, a Mother's Day card that was in Spanish. I don't know Spanish, and my mom doesn't know Spanish, all right? But I bought her this card, and at the bottom of the card, I just very simply wrote, the English language can't communicate to you how I feel about you as my mother. Love, Ben. And I thought it was clever. I thought it was funny. I thought it would be the kind of thing that she would keep the rest of her life. Turns out it has zero value if you can't read it, right? Like it didn't mean anything to her. And she, she called me an idiot, all right? Like that's <laughs> how it played out. And I'd like to disagree with her, but she has some strong valid points, okay? <laughs> if the written word doesn't have clarity, if it doesn't bring clarity, then it loses its value. But that's the power of the written word is it does bring clarity. Years ago when, when Christine and I were first dating, We'd been dating a couple months, and over the course of the summer, I ended up traveling a lot for a job that I had. I was gone for weeks at a time all over the country. And the night before I went off on my first trip, we were hanging out, and she says, hey, I, I put a gift for you in your, in your uh, suitcase, but you're not allowed to, like, do anything with it, look at it. There's instructions for it. Uh, just wait until tomorrow and then go from there. And so the next morning, like, I woke up anxious, like, what is this gift that she's gotten me? And I opened it up, and I found a stack of envelopes, each with a different date on them for the next, like, three and a half weeks, okay? And each of them, this is really cool, right? She had these, she wrote me letters, one for every day, for all these weeks. And we were still kind of new in our relationship, and I start reading through them uh, appropriately, one a day, all right? And I start reading through them, and, and she's speaking things about who she is and she's encouraging me and what it is that she loves about me she's putting scripture into it and there's prayers in there as well and just all these powerful things these are these are valuable letters that weren't exactly what I thought they'd be all right but I as something that was good that we still have we've kept these as a significant memento of, of, of our relationship right and over the course of the summer, this is like pre-smartphones, all that kind of stuff. And so I would, I'd had to go find like a real computer to send her emails back, right? It's like pre-texting world, okay? And so I would, from time to time, send her letters back. And it was really kind of cool. And then at the end of the summer, I broke up with her. Now, that's a whole <laughs> other story that we don't have time for today, okay? But several days after breaking up with her, we're back together and we're trying to kind of work through where we were at, thinking through the, our relationship and whatnot. And one of the things we did was we visited the written words. We went back and we saw the things that we'd written to one another and they had a powerful meaning to us. They reminded us of the things we thought and the things that we felt. And it was a powerful thing that brought us back together. You know this. You know that a letter from your child means more than just about anything else in the world, doesn't it? I've got one hanging on my wall in my office. In my bedroom uh, with my wife, we have uh, hung up on the wall, framed, matted, set up with a nice little background. It's really pretty. We have the manuscript from our wedding that I made several years ago for her. It didn't mean as much to her as it did to me, <laughs> but it's powerful. The written words, the things that we've communicated are powerful, and we have God's written words. We have them. These are the most important things that he wanted us to know. We have it, and we have it in writing. And the surest way that we have of knowing what God wants, what he wants of us, and what he wants for us, and what he wants from us, is when we examine the words that he's already made available to us. 
It's absolutely key and foundational. And there's, again, lots of other ways that God speaks to us, but they always come back to this. It always comes back to what his word says because he will never lead you now in a way that he hasn't communicated in scripture in the past. His leading is never going to contradict scripture. In fact, if you feel like God is leading you in some, some special significant way, you feel like he's calling you to do something or, or whatever it may be, and you look into scripture and you find where it would contradict with what God has already communicated, then you need to know that what you're feeling, what you are trying to understand as God leading you is probably not God because he's not going to violate his own word. When we look into scripture, we see or we have a revelation of God's ways and his purposes and his heart. And it's that verse we read earlier from Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. It illuminates. It makes things more clear. God's word makes things in our world more clear, more understandable. And you look into the New Testament. And you don't have to just read the words in theory and thought, but you see them played out practically in the name of Jesus. God himself coming to this world and showing us what it looks like, not just to hear words, but to listen to them, to obey them, to do them. And we look through the New Testament and we see his followers who do the same kind of thing. We have the written word that expresses God's mind and heart. We see Jesus speaking and living and showing us in real words what it is to see the word of God. And then we have this spirit, the same spirit that we see working from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, the same spirit that moves Jesus and directs him, the same spirit that causes the New Testament writers to begin writing down what it looks like to be a church and how to live after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And the same spirit who's working and acting in these powerful, incredible ways is the same spirit that comes into us and communicates to you. And so there ought to be unity between what we believe God is speaking to us in the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful. It goes on, it says it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. But it's all God-breathed. God's never going to lead us in a way that contradicts his word. Not only that, but whenever we get into God's word, we're going to find a little bit of conflict. Not within his word itself, but within us. Because when you read and you see what God thinks and what he feels and what he wants, you're going to find that it doesn't always match what we think and what we feel and what we want. There's going to be some conflict. There's going to be a temptation to maybe turn on Scripture, to push it away, or to suggest that something's wrong with it. Romans 12, Paul addresses this very thing. He says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Whenever there's conflict, whenever I come up against Scripture and it doesn't fit what I want, Paul says, no, don't conform to the pattern that you're bringing into the word, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs to shift. I need to change to match where God is at. I need to shift. And then I like this. Paul says, if you do that, then you're going to be able to test and you're going to be able to approve what God's will is, his good and his pleasing and his perfect will. If you want to know what God would speak to you, if you want to know how God would lead you in this world, if you plug into his scripture, if you begin reading his words, and whenever it comes up in contradiction to you, instead of pushing away from the Bible, instead you work on transforming your mind to better understand who God is and what he wants from you, you're actually going to become a great uh, apologist for his will. You're going to understand what he's calling you to do because you're getting in line with him. That's the power of his scriptures. That's the power of his words. When we engage in it, it has the ability to change how we view things. And it matters how you view Scripture. It matters whether you see yourself as being above it or below it. That's one of the ways that we get it wrong. Sometimes we act as if we're an authority over Scripture. It's dangerous. We need to see God's Word held up in authority. There's other ways that we get this wrong too, right? There's this time in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is talking to some people. And he tells them this. He says, you're in error because you do not know the scriptures of the power of God. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures of the power of God. What's fascinating is that Jesus says this to professional religious people. They did know the scriptures. They knew it. They had it memorized. They knew it well. What Jesus was saying to them was that you hear it, but you don't do it. 
You're not listening. It's hitting your ears, but it's not resonating. In fact, in another place, Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs because they looked really pretty on the outside, but inside they were full of death. Does that make sense? They've got God's word. It hits the ears. It doesn't penetrate the heart. It doesn't create any change. One of the ways that we really mess up God's word is that we only hear it and we don't ever do it. It's the same thing we saw in James earlier. There's another way. There's a guy named John Wesley, a preacher of old. He writes it this way. Or he, he, what he says is that we often want to see the ends without the means. We want to get the results without the work necessary to get the results. And so he says we expect knowledge but we do it without searching the scriptures. We don't consult with the people of God. We want God to speak to us. We want to understand what God's doing and what he's up to, but we don't want to go to the place where we know we can find his plans. And we don't talk to the people who know his plans. He says we expect spiritual strength without constant prayer and steady watchfulness, or we expect God to be blessing us without hearing the word of God at every opportunity. We want all these things from God without us actually like leaning even towards him. We want to just know the things of God, but we don't want to study it. We want to have the strength that comes from, from God himself, but we don't want to actually seek it out in prayer or, or searching him out. We want God to just bless us, but we don't want to give up any of our time to go bless him. It's one of the ways that we mess up reading the word. There's lots of other ways too, guys. I mean, that. We could do this all day. There's lots of ways people dishonor the word of God. They talk about it like maybe it's myths and fairy tales. Some people speak of scripture uh, and dishonor it by saying that they accept it, but only whenever they agree with it. That's dishonoring. You know what the most frequent way is that we dishonor the word of God? It's done by Jesus followers. It's not by dissenters. It's by Jesus followers who don't take the time or effort to know what's in it. Have no interest in actually reading it or knowing what God would have to say. Do you understand that there's any part of you, if there's anything within you that at all desires to know who God is and what he would speak to us? If, if you've ever wondered, if I could sit down with God and have a conversation, I wonder what he would want to tell me. It's his word, guys. The surest way, the surest way we have of knowing what God wants of us and for us and from us is when we examine the words that he's already made available to us so where to start if, if this is a big challenge for you the idea of you actually beginning to read God's word trying to know who he is I'm, I'm going to give you a couple tips real quick and if you're already in some situation where you're already studying the Bible somewhat this will help you kind of even take it a little bit further the first thing you need to do is you need to find a good translation that you can understand find the word of God written in a way that you talk all right. And so I'm like, we're living in Kentucky. I don't know anyone who speaks like how the King James Version speaks. All right. And so that's probably not the version for you. Okay. Now, personally, I like the NIV. I love the message. It's a very contemporary kind of summation of scripture in a lot of places. It's not a great literal translation, but it's a good writing in our language. The NLT is good. There's several others. Find the one that makes sense to you. Number two, read a little bit every day. Just read a little bit. Maybe that's a verse. Maybe you're starting out. Just start with a verse. Read a verse. Read, uh, read a chapter. Read, if you're already doing that, maybe find a couple different places where you can read some chapters. And number three, find a guide. All Scripture is God-breathed. We read that earlier. Not all Scripture is equally useful. And that's somewhat controversial to say, all right? But there are some places in the Bible that if you are not a Bible reader and you want to start out, there are some places in the Bible that if you just jumped in and started reading, it would potentially like mess you up. Like it'd be confusing. It wouldn't make sense. You wouldn't understand the context. It's like there's strange stories, okay? There are right places to start and wrong places to start, okay? Uh, and, and so just because it's all God breathed doesn't mean it's all equally useful. And so you need to find a guide. If you're brand new to Jesus, if you're brand new to the idea of even there being a God, I'd encourage you to read the Gospel of John. It's the third book in the New Testament. Uh, the fourth book, I'm sorry, the fourth book in the New Testament. Yeah, my bad. Yeah. It's in your table of contents. Look it up. All right. There we go. Thank you, Shakur. Find a guide. I would encourage you to start there. It's a great 
It's a great writing just of who Jesus is, what he taught, how he lived, all those good things. Uh, download the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. It's free. It's simple. It has devotions. It has l- reading plans. It has tons of information, easy for you to follow and, and go along. It's a great resource. Find a guide. Find something that can help lead you into Scripture and introduce you into what it is. And if you're new, if you're within that group at the beginning that wonders whether or not this is even the Word of God, if you're questioning that level, if, if you're new to church and you want to know more, but you're not really sure what to do, just start. Try it. I dare you to investigate it. I dare you to start reading it, and I dare you to try it. I dare you to actually do what it says. The book of James that we've quoted a couple times is a great book to start out in because it's all just very practical living in the name of Jesus. I dare you to try it. Maybe, maybe you're a Jesus follower, but you haven't been serious about the word of God. Why not? What's keeping you from wanting to know what your God would have to say to you? What's keeping you from being led by God? What's holding you back? I want to challenge you to just take some very practical steps this week. What can you do to get more serious about God's word? Why don't you pray with me? God, I am so grateful that your grace extends past our ability to listen. God, I'm grateful that even as we struggle in hearing to actually doing, that you're patient, you communicate to us over and over again. God, I pray that we would take seriously your word, that we would look into your word, into the words that you've given us, and we would see them as the, for having the great value that they do, God that you have chosen to communicate to us, to reveal yourself to us, and to call us to something bigger than ourselves. And so God, give us, give us a desire, put it within us. Give us a curiosity that would cause us to examine your word. God, you're good. It's in Jesus' name we pray.